So in the last few days, as we see what started in Minneapolis and then went to Atlanta and Seattle and then everywhere in the U.S., it's interesting how consuming a news cycle can make the most concerning issue of three days ago almost completely absent in people's minds and attention. But you also lose almost all perspective if that happens. So it's important to kind of pay attention to the sequence of things and the narrative arc and the things that are not forefront in the attention cycle. So right before the racial violence uh, became forefront, we were seeing in the U.S. an escalation towards violence that was very left-right oriented between red state, blue state, having different focus around how they were going to open. And it was kind of showing up as the mask wearers versus the non-mask wearers. And we saw armed people going to Capitol buildings uh, in protest of quarantine and shutdown. We also started to see an increase in racial focus in the news over the week leading up to uh, the case in Minneapolis that set it all off. And I'm not going to say like a single narrative of some central command and control function that I think is orchestrating everything, but I'm going to mention anomalies that I think you should be paying attention to. <clears throat> so we see the case of the man who was jogging and the uh, retired cop and his son shot him. That was like a week before. And then we see increased news of white supremacy and a lot more images of white guys with guns at Capitol buildings. Then we see uh, in relationship to the guy who was running and got shot and there were protests, uh, black open carry of weapons associated with the protests and then also black open carry of weapons taking, uh, escorting a black uh, lawmaker to the uh, courthouse or some state building. And then we see Joe Biden's comments about you ain't black and like just a whole bunch of increase in race attention in primary news cycles. And then we see the case with George Floyd. So there's a big question for me of like, did we just have a particular an unusually racist week? Or does the news cycle not actually reflect the background rate of things for other reasons? And for, for every situation like we see with George Floyd, the number of those that aren't caught, uh, like it's just, um, it's just a much less rare phenomena than I think most people think it is, sadly. I think most black people in inner cities know it's not as rare a phenomena. Um, so then we see the video circulating that the, we see this guy with a, hammer and black tactical gear breaking the windows of the auto zone, right? In Minneapolis. And we see people jumping to thinking, uh, assessing that he's a, a cop as an ancient provocateur or that uh, he is a Antifa guy or a white supremacist or a Soros agent. There's a lot of different hypotheses. But a lot of images are surfacing of the buildings being set on fire and the windows being broken by white people at the black protest rallies that were not breaking, like the, the initial movement to property destruction and violence was not actually them. And broken windows theory is very clear that once, like once the first Molotov cocktails thrown and it becomes much easier to engage in throwing Molotov cocktails once the first windows are broken because uh, there's like a, a threshold to move past that that has already been broken. And so the idea that um, police officers or people with other agendas infiltrate a protest group that is otherwise peaceful and throw the first rock to justify use of police force on the other side, like that's a very well-known phenomena. But right now we can hypothesize a lot of groups that would have a motive to do it for a lot of reasons. So some people either are buying the standard narrative or they're too quickly jumping to the alternate narrative of it was the cop for this reason or it was the white supremacists trying to blame the black guys or it was um, the deep state Hillary Clinton 
Joe Biden supporting liberals that are trying to create insight, more reason to uh, have people stay at home than the quarantine already was to move towards their goal to steal an election. There's like a gazillion hypotheses. I think the problem is the people who aren't buying the mainstream media narrative are buying the first alternate narrative that appeals to their sense-making desire to not have uncertainty and put the pieces together before there is adequate evidence that that alternate narrative is actually much better. So the guy who broke the windows was definitely not a normal part of the protest, but I don't know who he was an agent for or what the motive was because the data that suggests any of the 10 different hypotheses are not solid yet. So one of the things I'm wanting to encourage is don't let your attention cycle be controlled by the attention cycle of your social media feed or your mainstream news. That's one thing. The other thing is be very careful about how easy it is to get induced into being on one side of group think and conflict theory. Let's talk about conflict theory for a moment. It's, there's a few types of natural cleavings or easy cleavings, if not natural, where it's very easy to drive conflict between people. Political left, right is a very easy one. You can do red state, blue state stuff. You can do, they have a make America great again hat versus a, a rainbow gay flag. Like they're, they're literally wearing flags of different kinds to symbolize red shirt, blue shirt, right? Like the type, type of team they're in. And then you can drive conflict between them, which both creates a sense of clear sense making of, I know who my team is. I know what my, my, the group think of the narrative on my side is. And so red, blue is very easy. People versus the cops is very easy. Race issues are very easy. Race is maybe the easiest because it's where the flag is biologically built in. If everybody here has not studied conflict theory, you're going to have a hard time making sense of the world without a good model of how conflict arises between people, how it gets intentionally stirred up, how people resolve it. And there's a lot of different schools of conflict theory that are worth studying, but at at minimum, everybody should know Rene Girard's work. Um, and I'm not saying that I agree with Girard. There are things that he said that were extremely insightful. Um, so specifically, his idea is that the fundamental nature of conflict comes from the fact that desire is mimetic, meaning that we learn to want stuff the same way we learn language by watching other people. And that I don't know Mandarin and I don't know Swahili and I don't know Dutch because I didn't watch people speaking those. I watched people speaking English. So I got conditioned to think in a worldview through aesthetic frames, through like it's very deep how much my whole identity and everything was conditioned by what I watched. So his argument is that much of what we want is also conditioned by watching people. And so we end up innately wanting what other people have, which means that desire inexorably drives conflict. Somebody, people have stuff, you want that thing or similar kinds of things. Then as more people are wanting the same things and conflicting over it, the conflict itself becomes mimetic. People learn through mimesis to identify with the Zionist or the anti-Zionist side based on which side of the wall they grew up on or the you know, whatever the conflict they happen to have been born into. And then in Girard's model, the conflict continues to increase until there's so much embodied energy that you're going to get something like a war. And the least violent way to deal with it is to have a scapegoat, a sacrificial, rather than a all against all war, be able to have some sacrificial person that everybody gets, uh, that is able to be effectively blamed for the whole scenario and, then we're able to take them out and decrease the embodied conflict energy for a while. And then the cycle has to repeat. Um, Gerard's work really says that there is no, there historically has been no way out of that. And the role of various religions was to figure out 
uh, how to do scapegoating well. And that that's what all of the sacrifices of various religious traditions were about. That um, Christianity was actually trying to get rid of scapegoating by showing that the person they scapegoated was actually innocent and not only innocent, but the highest kind of uh, innocent. So that the way people would get out of his answer, actually, of how you get out of scapegoating was everyone develop Christ-like virtues. Um, but specifically, as Critique said, that by getting rid of religion, and this is relevant to the goals of this group that is trying to reinvoke some of the things religion did, like the development of human virtue. Um, by getting rid of religion, we got rid of the way of dealing with the mimetic conflict while simultaneously getting much, much larger weapons of destruction. So that rather than have things heat up in Europe and kill a Jew sacrificially, it had to be this massive kind of killing of all of these Jews. And so, uh, okay, so why am I bringing that up? I think it's very easy to, I think there are, are lots of reasons to want to drive conflict and to want to keep groups of people having attention focused in different ways. Maybe this is actually the way I'll talk about it. Power pretty much translates to power over other people. To have power over their behaviors, whether I want people to vote for me in a particular way, or I want them to buy my stuff, or I want them to publicly support my ideas. I need to control other people's behavior. To control their behavior, I need to control their minds. And so warfare is main, mainly not fought with bullets. Like the kinetic warfare that we think of as warfare that's fought with weapons is maybe 1% of warfare. 99% of warfare is diplomatic warfare, political warfare, economic warfare, narrative warfare, information warfare. All of this comes together to what we call hybrid warfare or really just politics or game theory or the game of power. But, but think of it as um, uh, high, hybrid or population centric warfare. So in this war, the treasure being fought over is people's minds and the battleground is people's minds. The primary weapons are tools, the tools of narrative influence and emotional evocation and control of the information flows. And in these wars, they're asymmetric wars because you have some actors that have access to billion or trillion dollar level um, information technologies, AI empowered micro-targeting. And then you have other people who are just trying to figure shit out on their own and they don't even know they're in a war. And they don't even know that their own mind is the battleground of the war and they think they believe the shit they believe and they think they came to it on their own. They think they're doing a good job sense making. And they don't realize that as they're researching of the trillions of pages of shit they could see, the ones that they will ever even be able to see based on what shows up in their YouTube feed or their Google search were manipulated by algorithms that have agendas behind them. Um, as well as the original source material of whoever put it out for which reasons. Okay, so zooming out from the current violence for a moment we have an election coming up in the US that will be radically consequential for the world. Either way, no matter who wins currently, whether the election is illegally tampered with and stolen or not, half of the population will think it was. This is a real problem, right? Because what happens when a a third to a half of the population, no matter which way it goes, thinks that it was stolen and thinks it was radically consequential. Well, like one of two really bad things happens. Either the people get violent, more, much more so than we currently have. And that sets off one whole cascade of scenarios where they don't get violent. And the people who want to steal elections get even clearer that they just can with impunity. Um, so we're like, fuck, 
What do we do with this moving forward? Now, mail-in ballots. Are mail-in ballots easier to uh, corrupt than in-person voting? Yep, totally. And, And COVID as one reason, violence could be another, but COVID is one reason to have mail-in ballots. Like, might there be reasons associated with that? Yeah. Now, might there be reasons that people who really want Trump out of office would want to initiate things that make Trump look worse and that say, look at all the bad shit that's happening during Trump? We could also talk about what motives the Trump campaign would have to uh, be engaged in something where you wouldn't want transfer of power to occur. So I'm not, there, there's a, there's a version of this that is easy to buy for either political leaning. I don't find that most successful politicians that I have encountered near the top of the power actually believe red versus blue ideology. They just believe in the game of power and they signal red versus blue ideology as part of their mimetic warfare to control the people that are going to vote for them. Um, Just like I don't think most of the people that end up engaging religions and holy wars at the most strategic level really even are religious. I think they know that these are ways to get people to do things for reasons that are mostly strategic. As we look at war a little bit more and we look at the tension heating up on the India-China border, it's such a big deal like what's happening there and the India, China, Pakistan interaction and the India, China, Russia interaction. And as we look at it with COVID related stuff, obviously what, what happens to the spread of the virus with all of the protests that are definitely not social distancing? Well, we'll find out. Um, What happens when like with Germany and South Korea in China, who started to get second waves of infection after reopening. What happens when we start to get second waves here and the political tension is so heated around the idea of closing again? And then we also start to see things like because of the COVID shutdown of transportation, the food supply system got radically damaged, right? give or take the food supply for 2 billion people got damaged. And so Nigeria has a 25 million person insecure food population that all went from food insecure to actually don't have food. And now violence has been raising on the ground, both insurgencies, local crime and Boko Haram. That's probably going to trigger an exodus and a massive refugee situation but after Syria, it's like, where do the refugees go? So then what, what comes from that conflict? Why? So we're definitely at a unique moment in the world. We are at a moment where because of the connectedness of supply chains, because of the ability for viruses in airplanes to move around the world so fast, because of the ability of news cycles to move so fast. So we go from an event in Minneapolis to in every city because of, because of those things, the interconnection, for the cascade of events from anywhere to everywhere and from one sector to other sectors is so high on top of systemic fragility, on top of very high embodied emotional energy. Um, This next phase of time is going to see a continuance of a cascade of very serious problems. How, How do we make sense of the world given all of these dynamics and how do we respond? I always feel stuck when someone asks me the how do we for some very large audience of we respond because it's going to be very different based on people's skills and capacities and interests. There's not like a very good generalized answer to that. Um, Like David, how are you responding? Well, you're trying to both put out information that helps people and share frames that help people process information. And maybe that helps them get less emotionally hijacked so they can have some more clarity. Like those seem like within your bailiwick of things to do that you can do super important things that need done. Um, 
there's going to be an equivalent of that in totally different ways that everyone on here has as a possibility. So I think people recognizing that they actually have some choice in where they put their attention and some choice in the meaning they make. So both where they focus and actually they have choice in where they put their attention. They have choice in the process of coming to belief. Are they just kind of letting themselves by the conclusions put in front or are they really asking the, am I sure of this? How would I be sure of this? Because they're going, there's going to be a response to their own sense of certainty or uncertainty. And they also have some choice in the meaning they make around the things. And all of this is going to affect their state. So that means that overwhelm is something someone really has a choice to indulge or not. And so sometimes I'll notice that there's so much coming in and I'm like, what the fuck do I do about this? And there's a beginning impulse of overwhelm. And I know I, I, I'm not trying to pretend or repress it, but I also know that going into an overwhelmed spiral is not useful. And I have a kind of deep commitment to be useful. So I have a deep commitment to want to think about things in a way that allows me to continue to respond. So I'll be like, okay, well, let's just step back and actually write down what are all the things that I see going on? Let's make a situational assessment map, right? Let's, so rather than just start to spiral into something like, let me start to identify what are the knowns? What are the unknowns? What are the things I might be able to do something about where I want to put more of my sense making into that area because I might actually have some agency in that area. So some people on here that will, what is theirs to do will be largely around um, serving their local communities. But, uh, you know, other people might have um, might work in the finance sector and have specific things that they can do that are particularly meaningful to be able to get the right types of projects funded or, um, yeah, I don't know. What I can say not to do, right, is definitely make sure, okay, here's an important one. I'll say one thing to do. Understand the basics of strategy if you're going to try and do anything so that you don't just make shit worse or be totally useless. So strategy 101. Every response, everything that you do, if you're effective, some people will not like and it will evoke a counter response. Factor the counter response in what you're doing and see if it's still a good idea. If you are not factoring counter responses, you are not doing strategy. You are just being reactive. Now you might be super righteous in your reactivity, but you, that does mean that you are actually a pawn that is being manipulated by forces that are doing strategy. You aren't actually doing strategy. And so if you're wanting to do something to make sure Trump doesn't get reelected or to make sure that uh, systemic racism gets addressed or whatever it is. You just have to think in this particular action, who that will feel threatened by this will counter respond in what ways and what resources are available to them. And if I'm escalating the game, right, if I'm increasing the war on one side, driving an arms race of escalation, am I driving it in the right direction? do that. If you aren't doing that, then you're most likely escalating things in the wrong direction with whatever you're doing. I guess listening to you, I mean, we've, we've done quite a lot of conversations around, I think phase shift for humanity was the first one where you talked about the self-terminating nature of the current dynamic. And I guess it's one thing to talk about that and to, to have seen it as a possibility. It's another one when you feel it on a kind of visceral level. Um, and I wonder, I just wonder whether you, cause you talk, I mean, you use some beautiful metaphors about the caterpillar and the butterfly. And um, I, I'd say for, for talking about kind of phase shift and 
um, self-terminating systems, you actually sketch out quite a sort of positive vision as well. Has, has that changed or are you, are you still? No, it hasn't changed. Um, I think that everything that's happening right now was going to happen some version of it. There's a lot of path dependencies. It, it didn't have to have COVID as a path in. It could have been a different pandemic or it could have been grid collapse or it could have been um, climate change driving refugees, driving a war. There's a gazillion things that could have started the, uh, sus the systemic cascades. But it was inevitable, which is why like that's mostly what I've talked about for the last six or seven years was trying to help, help people say that was inevitable. Let's see what we can do to um, do anticipatory good, good things. If you identify every area that there is a risk, there is also a, a meaningful upside. And this is a way to think about what might be yours to do. When an environmental niche gets disturbed, it's much easier to have new things come in and change the, the process. Um, so if we go through and look at all of the areas where there are major problems and where there are major risks and say, what is the system that's actually breaking down and what would a better version of that system be and what could we do? to implement those better versions of the system rather than try to reinstate the security of the old ones, that would be a beginning of thinking about the opportunity space. And we could talk about that with global finance. We could talk about it with infrastructure. We could talk about it with the healthcare system on and on, right? The judicial reform, all those things. And um, someone just posted this in the chat and I think it's really true so far. It seems, the, the, the pandemic and the crisis is accelerating all of the, we're not in a shift into a new system. It seems to be just accelerating and compounding all of the worst aspects of the old one. Most. Do, do you, do you have a sense of, of how that process might play out and where, where's the sort of hope um, in that? If there is any. Most people who care about things widely, care about the global commons long-term, suck at doing things. Like, they suck at doing things at scale. Because most anyone who's good at doing things at scale won at the game of power. Because to do things at scale means to be able to influence things in a way that will beat out competitors and go against people who want things to go otherwise. So right now there's a lot of people during, like during the COVID time, there's a lot of people feeling like they have more free time than ever, but the most powerful people in the world have been busier than ever during this time. They have been consolidating the market and buying up distressed assets and massively increasing, um, opportunism during this time. So one of the things I would say is necessary for it to be other than you just said, David, is that the people who actually are committed to the well-being of humanity and the earth and civilization long term must learn to be how must learn how to be effective at actually making things happen at a global level. Would you like to ask your question, Robin? Uh, yes. What do you have to say about, uh, yes, the, the resource of uh, cross-generational mentoring and uh, networking in, in the situation we're in? It's, it's complex. It's easy to say mm, cross-generational collaboration is good. Like it's, it's easy to say that di diverse perspectives of any kind being in conversation will enrich everyone who is there. That's true. The current situation that we're facing, the last times we faced situations that were relevantly analogous, none of those people are still alive. 
in terms of the generations that actually know anything about it. Like the people who were in World War II aren't still here. The people who were in the Great Depression aren't still here. The people who were in the 1918 plague aren't still here. And this is like if you study generational theory like Strauss Howe or you study Baudrillard, typically things repeat on the cycle that once the people who had the hard won knowledge are dead, we repeat the thing because they're gone, right? So part of the generational connection I want people to do is study the work of the people who really understood the last relevant issues who happened to be dead, that might have been alive a little while ago. Um, now, there are still people who were involved in, in Vietnam and the counterculture movement and who were involved in different times that are relevant um, and to discuss. So, like, I have a friend, Mark Stallman. He was involved during that generation, but he was doing intelligence work. And, like, he was working with Freeman Dyson directly regarding what was brought to JFK to do with Carew's chef. That was a big part of what led to things that broke down there. So there's knowledge that he has firsthand that's super directly relevant. But like when I look at the counterculture movement as a whole, and I look at the green revolution and the sexual revolution and the civil rights process and the uh, women's rights, all the various things, the deeper story that I see most of the activists who are there don't know the deeper story I see is like actually understanding COINTELPRO and how the FBI, CIA, and other intelligence agencies actually infiltrated the, um, the progressive movements to very specifically derail them and get them focused on shit that would be ineffective that, is, that we're still doing today. So I happen to believe that there was intentional upregulation by those power structures of postmodernism as a structure of thought. Because if the people who studied social science only studied how to critique the game of power without actually knowing how to effectively organize, then it would make sure that they never could actually really do anything. So if every time someone's organizing well, you call it imperialism, you won't end up organizing well and becoming an imperialist so you'll just be noise and that's fine um and the social sciences that are like actually studying the history of military theory and political theory and and strategy itself got very down regulated in exchange for something that would make people feel more righteous while being less effective and so I want to make sure that we're learning the right lessons from the right periods of history. So what I would say is that when I think about generations and I take all the generations that are alive now, I would say that 99% of the people in all those generations have been the victims of intentional disinformation and are mostly just all confused. So we can have intergenerational sharing of some confused generations with others. It's still nice to have different perspectives, but I would mostly like for people to have more clear and incisive insight at all and across a longer time period than their own experience, a deeper study of history and like that. So I was just wondering what, you know, where, where you feel stuck and you feel like you're kind of in a hopeless situation, making space uh, for grief. So emotions of all kind can influence our sense making. They can also influence our choice making. I want we all know what it's like to have emotions that are not being clearly processed influence our choice making in uh, damaging ways, right? Reacting out of uh, anger or whatever. But then we can also say, okay, so I don't want to be reactive emotionally. So I'm going to suppress emotions and pretend to, to do like 
do a bad version of stoicism and just uh, numb down emotional intelligence, in which case I'm taking one whole type of information, one whole way of sense making and turning it off. And you could call emotion, um, this is reductive, but I'm just saying one lens, you could call emotion a way of being able to read warm data. Um, Partly our emotion is responding to the situation. Partly our emotion is responding to the narrative we make of the situation. So in terms of the narrative we make, that's where we want to do CBT or DBT or Byron Katie's The Work or Krishnamurti's Inquiry to see where did I make up some meaning that fucked me up. But then there are some times where it's like, if I see a cop kneeling on someone's neck and killing them and I don't feel angry, something is wrong with me. Like, that's not about meaning making. I To actually try and say, no, I'm only upset because of meaning making means I have to instantiate a metaphysics where nothing matters and then say, well, I'm meaning made. Well, yes, I have a metaphysics where things matter. And in a metaphysics where anything matters, then if the sacred is being harmed, I can feel pissed off. I can feel sad. I can feel scared. Right. So, uh, you know, I'm kind of inundated in data about, catastrophic risk. So the most fucked up things all the time. And so it doesn't have the same emotional response immediately that it did the first time that I was exposed to it. But I still will just sit back, put my computer down and just cry when I think about what's fucking happening in Nigeria, or when I think about what's about to happen, or because if I don't, I will actually have to deaden something. And then I become less sensitive, which means my sensing decreases and the wholeness of self decreases. So, um, yeah, you, you neither want to let, you neither want to repress the emotions and not listen to them and learn from them, nor do you want to just unconsciously act on them. You want to incorporate that into a, a way that you're connecting to and making sense of reality. This was one of the talks from the Rebel Wisdom Festival. A dozen more films from the festival are available in our members area from John Viveki, Jordan Hall, Nora Bateson, Jamie Wheel, Douglas Rushkoff, and many more. So become a Rebel Wisdom member and get access to loads of exclusive films and join the Rebel Wisdom community for sense-making calls, our wisdom gym, and more. We're also running our online course again soon, Sense-Making 101, with faculty including Daniel Schmachtenberger. Check out the website for more.